Hastings. Wow. Wow. Okay. It is very nice to be here, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, I really appreciate you. Oh, thank you, my living boyfriend right there. <laughs> One glass of sherry in him and he goes nuts. You know, I was sitting backstage and uh, they were telling me, well, at some point, Drew, there has to be a name. Uh, you have to title, name this special. And uh, I didn't know what I was gonna do when I came out here earlier and I thought, you know what? Is that gonna be in the shot? I said, yes. I said, how about Drew Hastings live at the vagina? <laughs> and I say, live at the vagina. And then I said, you know what? I'm not sure about the red. I said, you know, any other time, any other color? <laughs> I said, you know what? People get the, you know, it's just a bad connotation. So, <laughs> hope you like, the, uh, you like the new glasses. These are my Al Sharpton frames, of course. Big, black, you can see right through them. <laughs> I have a... Uh... Buddy of mine said, buddy of mine said, you know, Drew, I don't know if I'd say that. You know, nowadays, oh, you know, people might construe that as being racist. And then he goes on to tell me, you know, you know, Drew, people aren't born racist. People are taught racism. You know, I said, you know, I think you're right. I remember my third grade racism teacher, Mrs. Davis. <laughs> I had a crush on her. But I'm trying to get, uh, I'm trying to get uh, just a little more calm here. I had... Uh, Women are the bane of my existence. I, you know, I think women are the greatest thing in the world and I, it's just, I can't, I'm trying to get things, been trying to get things back together with my girlfriend and I don't know, I look, you look back at a relationship and it started the first time we did anything together. Uh, some of you may have heard me tell this story before, but I drove, I had a, a 76, El Dorado Cadillac, and it was a nice one. It was clean. It had a vanity tag said Jew Canoe on it. That's just, I love that car. <laughs> they wouldn't give me that tag in California. I was living in LA, and they said, oh, we can't get it. And I said, well, I'll just move back to Ohio. They don't give a shit about Jews back there. They'll title it. <laughs> so they gave me Jew Canoe. And I said, I'm going to drive this thing on Route 66. We're going to take a romantic drive. We just started going out. We're going to drive all the way across the country on Route 66 in this Cadillac. Well, we get into Missouri. And Missouri, I don't like Missourians much anyway. You know, they, you know, they, they, they all look like extras out of Clint Eastwood films. And <laughs> most horse thieves come out of Missouri. Everybody knows that. And so we're going down in southern Missouri. And, there's the, and, and the, you start seeing billboards for this exotic paradise animal park. And it's one of these huge exotic places where it's got all the different animals, like a zoo that you drive through and you see all the animals. And she keeps hassling, oh, let's stop and see the animals. Let's stop, it's coming. No, it's a damn ripoff. We're not gonna go see the damn animals. This is bullshit. <laughs> so we drive and there's another one. 25 miles, Paradise Animal Park. Oh, let's stop and see the animals. No, we're not gonna see the damn animals. It's just a big Missouri ripoff. <laughs> Finally, she talked me into them because I, I had wanted to stop at Merrimack Caverns, which is, have you ever been to that fucking rip off? <laughs> Further up the road in Missouri, which is just a world famous Merrimack Caverns, which is bullshit because I have played London. I have been, I have been to Paris. They never heard of Merrimack Caverns over there. <laughs> so that's a crock of shit. <laughs> so anyway, she said, well, you got to go to Merrimack Caverns. Let's go to the Paradise Animal Park. Fine. So we pull off. It's almost five o'clock. We pull up to the kiosk pull up to the kiosk and uh, the girl said, well, we're about to close you. The last one's coming in. And we pull up and she's a pretty girl, you know, in that slutty Missouri way. <laughs> you know, you know, the blonde's roots are so bad. It looks like she's wearing a yarmulke. <laughs> so I pay her. She, she hands us the money and I see that she's missing part of her left arm. Now, 
I grew up working in some factories and stuff. I know industrial accidents. This was not an indu- this, was, this was torn off somehow. This is, so I already know we've got problems going in this thing. And she sells us this overpriced food, you know, which is nothing more than Purina dog chow in like an emu size, right? So we get in. My girlfriend's all excited. We get in. We're not even 500 yards into this place, and the car breaks down. Well, it does, it's still running, but it won't move. Now, I don't know. The brakes have locked up. I thought, you know what? We passed through a little herd of some kind of goats. We pro- I hit a goat, and somehow I've wrapped it around the transaxle. <laughs> You know, it's caught up in there. I just need to, you know, you know, burn through the goat. You know what I mean? You know, and I feel, wow, it's no wonder they use them for guitars. So these things are strong. And I can't burn through the goat that I think is caught up under the wheels. So I get out of the car and I go under and I'm looking, why is the problem? Why is the car not running? And I come back out and I look and there's a cloud a big dust cloud in the distance, this huge dust cloud, and like, I hear rumbling, and I look, and I realize, it's animals. They're fucking animals coming at us. And then I realize that, you know, these unlicensed Missouri play, we're the food source. For the, they don't feed these damn animals. These are the animals you see that like attack people and, on YouTube and stuff, and then get sent off to a place like this, you know. This is like a gulag for animals. And we come, and now they're rushing towards the car. Hundreds of... And I look over, and my girlfriend, who I think is going to be excited to see the animals, curls up in a ball and gets down on the floor of the car. No! Oh, no, honey! Look! Here come the goddamn animals! Look, honey, here they come! No, get up! Look at the goddamn... Now they're coming and they're emaciated as hell. Their ribs are showing and they're, you know, one of, them, one of these things has blue paint smeared on it like it broken into a maintenance shed looking for food. And, I, and finally, I, you know, and, they're, and they are, they're starving. And I'm telling them, they're coming up and they come up and half of them just boom, bounce off the car. And I'm like, gee, they're tearing up the car. Immediately they smell the food. Three of them stick their head in. Now I'm like, they're tearing up the damn headliner. Look at the goddamn animals. <laughs> and these things are so emaciated. Their motto of this place should have been where the lion lays down with the lamb because both are too malnourished to even stand up. <laughs> God. I can't even finish that story. I just get worked up. <laughs> but that... is the history I have with this woman. That is the history. I don't know. I, uh, and I question, I marvel at people that are in relationships, long time, you know, you're married, right? How long? 13 years. 13 years. How commendable to me. Five years, that's the best I've ever done. <laughs> I'm 52. I mean, five years. You think about it, I think... You know, since I've been 18, I've probably been in 10 serious relationships. I mean, what are the odds of meeting that many screwed up women in a row? It's it's gotta be astronomical. 13 years. But it's amazing how we even end up in relationships, you know, and, and, and what's the dynamic that even, starts them. You ever been having sex with somebody and in the middle of it all, in the heat of passion, you say, I love you, but you don't really mean it. (laughs) And then you're stuck with them for the next 13 years. I meant I love you when I'm boinking you. <laughs> I don't know. You know, maybe we set the bar too high. Somewhere when we are young, we decide 
what love is and what we are going to aspire to. For me, 1978, there used to be a show on CBS. Some of you might remember, it was called Heart to Heart. <laughs> and I used to watch Heart to Heart faithfully. It was Robert Wagner, Stephanie Powers, they were both good looking. And they were filthy rich. And they'd been married 15 years and they still couldn't keep their hands off each other. And every weekend they would be a, they'd be private eyes and they'd fight international art thieves. And they'd be in parking garages having shootouts. <laughs> I'm out of ammunition. I fucking love you. <laughs> and at the end of every episode, there was a trail of designer clothes on the floor leading back to the bedroom. You just knew what was going on. I said, yeah, that's gonna be my life. Yeah, heart to heart, nothing less, Jack. Unfortunately, in 78, I made six grand and was dating a co whore named Mindy. <laughs> so I had a big hole to climb out of. I don't know. I don't know. Maybe we're just incompatible. I'm a Pisces. She's a barbed fish hook in the corner of my mouth. I don't know, I just, uh, there's just a lot of stuff. As I get older, I just, you know, and maybe it's the age thing, you know, you hit 50, 50 does a number on you. Anybody here who's turned 50, man, psh, that'll humble your ego, huh? <laughs> Turn 50, suddenly realize your life's almost a third over at this point, right? <laughs> you know what it is? It's hard to be cool the older you get. When you're young, it's easy to be cool. But I like to think I'm still hip, standing up here in a Hugo Boss suit with gold bond powder and a corn pad between my toes. <laughs> it's not that funny. <laughs> yeah. Only exercise I get is mood swings, it seems like. <laughs> and I think, you know, why even bother, you know? Why even bother? Maybe I'm cynical, but at this point, at 50, healthy is just a precancerous condition, is it not? <laughs> I have a $300 clothes rack at home in the shape of an exercise bike, so. <laughs> My best friends always give me a hard way to go. Drew, God, you gotta quit smoking. It's just, it's slow suicide. Well, it's obviously not working, is it? <laughs> I mean, incremental suicide, not the most efficient way to do yourself in. Kind of like a woman saying, I'm gonna kill myself by, by bleeding to death one period at a time. <laughs> I gotta quit smoking. I get winded playing euchre. <laughs> I had a scare, man, about year or two ago, I'm, uh, I was, uh, I didn't feel good. I was like all pale. My friends all had to be convinced. You're getting ready to have a heart attack, dude. And I'm, uh, well, who knows? I don't know. And they get me convinced, convinced I'm going to have a heart attack. So they have me go to this big renowned heart center. They know, oh, you've got to go to the heart center. And I freak because the minute I pull into this heart center, you see that heart center on a building. I'm crying. Oh, geez. I go in the whole lobby is nothing but old people. I mean, you could have found older if you'd had a shovel to dig them up with. You know, I'm on the phone to my girlfriend who doesn't even believe I'm there because she doesn't think I have a fucking heart. So, right? So anyway, cardiologist comes down and talks to me. Now, he looks like he's 12, but those Indians are hard to gauge. You can't, you can't get a fix on, you know. And he tells me, oh, what we want to do, Mr. Hastings, we want to do something called a catheterization. We're going to take this tube, stick it in your femoral artery, run it all the way up here. Whoa, 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 whoa. First of all, I've got no health care. Is this over $200? <laughs> really? Is this something I can do myself? <laughs> Seems easy enough, like cleaning a bong, essentially, isn't it?
They want to shoot dye into my system. I'm trying to cut corners there. How about that writ, that laundry dye? You ever use that? <laughs> what do they do Easter eggs with? I think Paws makes it. Why don't we try that? <laughs> anyway, he tells me this is a standard procedure. It's done all the time, you know, but he's adamant that I sign this document titled Next of Kin. <laughs> now, you think about that for a minute. Next of Kin has to be the only hillbilly legal term in existence. <laughs> Who's coming down from the holler to fetch a corpse? <laughs> so I don't know. What do I know? <laughs> My best friend, he's trying to keep us together. He's always calling me. The same guy's on me about smoking. Oh, man, you need to try to stay together with your girlfriend. Work it out. Anyway, it's got to be nice having a girlfriend 20 years younger than you. No, it's not. You know what that means, having a girlfriend 20 years younger? It means you got to put up with the same bullshit you were putting up with 20 years ago. <laughs> you know? Yeah. And you know, I, I, maybe 20 years difference didn't used to be a big thing, but I think it is now. You know what? At the speed we go through of change, cultural change, all that stuff, it's, man, it's... She does things I don't even relate to, you know? I mean, you know what, occasionally, you know, every now and then we'll have oral sex. She'll, she'll go down on me. We call it head in the business, right? <laughs> anyway, she'll go down on me. Anyway, while she, when she does this, I kid you not, ladies and gentlemen, she looks at me. Maybe she finds it romantic. I find it very confrontational. <laughs> what the hell are you looking at me for? <laughs> what kind of Title IX empowerment kind of bullshit is this? <laughs> I'm old school. Just look at the ground like it's the dirty act that it is. <laughs> Have you no sense of shame? <laughs> you got that off the internet or something. I, you know. You know. And then on the other end, she can be very thoughtful. Well, well you know, she's... After sex, almost invariably, she'll say, well, now, ooh, now, did you come? <laughs> no, I didn't come. I got tired. <laughs> Lou Dobbs is on in five minutes. <laughs> I'm just not that goal-oriented anymore. <laughs> Maybe I'll come tomorrow. <laughs> Next week. You, you may not even be here when I get off. You have kids? Yeah. Man, my girlfriend, that was a big issue. My girlfriend just turned 30. So I, you know, wants to have a baby. Have a baby. Have a baby. I just hit 50. I'd end up shaking the baby to death from a palsy. <laughs> you have kids? That's been a big issue with me for a long time. I mean, I've wrestled with that for a long time. Oh, I'm. I'm the last male in my family. I should have kids. Oh, I'm going to get too old and then I'll regret not having them. And you know what? Something happened to me, and I don't want to get all spiritual on you, but so, something happened to me last year that took me off the fence about having kids. And I was in Atlanta, Georgia, about a year ago, sitting outside a coffee house one day. And this adorable, little cute, little four or five year old girl walks by with her mother. And right in front of me, like it was destined, she stops. And I hear her say to her mom, Mommy, you know what my three favorite colors are? And I was like, oh. And the mother looks down and she says, no, darling, what are they? And they just kept walking up the sidewalk and I thought, oh, there, th that's my problem. I don't give a fuck what your three <laughs> favorite colors are.
I don't think I care about one of them. And don't get me wrong, don't think I didn't feel bad. I felt horrible. But what's wrong with me? Why aren't I like everybody else? Where's my universal love for kids, parental instinct? What if I have children and I still feel like that about them? And then I talk to a married couple, people all the time, and they always, no, you won't, Drew. You know what's different when you have your own? Really? What if it's not? <laughs> what? Well, that's very pretty. Yeah, what did you attempt to draw there? Uh-huh. Well, why don't you tape that up on a fucking refrigerator? <laughs> Whoa! Oh, oh, don't touch me. You've got something sticky on your hand. Mm. Never touch me. What is your name again? And then I think, how do you end up like that? How do you end up like that? That dynamic you have between you and your children or your husband or boyfriend, where does that come from? has to be the way you're raised, must be. And I'm sure it is because I overheard myself not long ago talking out loud at home to my cat. <laughs> Who vomited on the goddamn rug and just left it there? <laughs> I know I certainly didn't do it. <laughs> and you just wanna crouch there staring mouth agape? <laughs> you wanna go back to the shelter? I'll send you right back to the damn shelter. Then I listen to myself. Oh, listen to you, Drew. Cold, unaffectionate. I sound exactly like my mom. <laughs> That's the way my mom is. Distant, aloof, you know, cold, English. My mother's English. You know what the English are like. Anybody here a child of English parents? Look, one, very few of us even survive. I'll tell you, it's, I don't know. I try to do it. And this whole aging thing. And now, you know, the elderly are, are like coming at me in huge numbers to join their ranks. It's like the world according to ARP. You know, I, I, I get mail from them every week. I got a temporary membership card. Like they've seen my health records or something. I, and their whole new thing now with the AARP, I don't know if you've noticed, but everything since now is everything's a youth culture. Their whole new motto is 50's the new 30. Like I'm gonna take my ARP card and line up some Coke on the glass coffee table <laughs> like it's 1977 again. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I'm not that. I'm not ready to be that old. I still feel like I got some of that 60s activism left in me. I notice even nowadays, I'm home cleaning furniture. I find myself spraying, fuck the pigs in Lemon Pledge. Yeah. 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 Nixon out now. Let's me make a little political statement and bring up a little shine on the end table, you know. Oh, God. <laughs> Ever occur to you that finding the clitoris on a woman <laughs> is a lot like trying to find the hole in a Starbucks lid when you're driving? <laughs> you, know, you can't really look for it. You just kind of got to move your tongue around. <laughs> flicking your tongue until you finally, flicking your tongue until you finally stumble across. Oh, there it is. <laughs> They'll keep that, won't they? Now, it's probably obvious to most of you that I'm a farmer. That's essentially what I do. I farm.
Believe it or not, I have not farmed that long. I've only been a farmer about two years. I, uh, I've been an urban guy my whole life. I always lived, I lived in New York, Los Angeles. I lived in San Francisco for a while. And you know, I was coming on 50 and I said, you know what, to hell with this. I'm gonna go back to Midwest where I'm from. I'm gonna get myself a farm. You know, well, I'll be honest. I don't even know how I got a farm. My credit score is six. I had to use my Speedway points on my financial statement. So I get this farm, and I don't know how many of you here have ever lived rural or in the country, but she's, it, it is creepy out there. If you're not, it is creepy. They'll tell you, at night, sun goes down, pitch black. Did you know that at night, possum, walking through a cornfield sounds exactly like three men with an ax. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And what kind of owl makes this sound? You're gonna die. <laughs> I kid you not, I am not making this up. My place is so far out there, Domino's Pizza will not deliver to me. I've never even heard of anything like I call Domino's now. Oh, we don't come that far. You're gonna have to drive up Newmarket Community Center, pull in the parking lot, flash your lights. We'll meet you. Like it's a drug deal. <laughs> do, do you have the pizza? Yes, do you have the money? Of course I got the fucking money. <laughs> Did anyone follow you here? They all drive tractors, for Christ's sakes. <laughs> I lived out there for a month before I figured out that red stick on my mailbox wasn't a country 911 system. I... <laughs> it is not easy. I'm gonna make it work. I don't give up, I'm not, I, you know, livestock, that's my dream, livestock, man. <laughs> But I'll tell you what, people think it's easy, you read up on it and it's, no, uh-uh. My first deal, I got ripped off. <laughs> I bought a herd of Black Angus hogs, right? <laughs> I thought they looked short coming off the truck. Pygmy cattle my ass. <laughs> I've tried growing crops, but <laughs> You'd find more cornrows on an NFL team than I could pull off my land. <laughs> uh, so I called Mr. Grimes. He's the county ag agent for my county, you know, like the Mr. Kimball dude, right? <laughs> and I call him, he comes out, you know, takes soil samples, talks to me extensively about my background. Well, he tells me the best thing for me to plant is a for sale sign in the front yard. <laughs> it is not easy, my friend, on the farm. Do you have any idea what well water does to highlights? Do you have any? You don't. <laughs> you know, I knew it was going to be hard. When I first moved out there, Six barn cats I had, six barn cats. I have one left, <laughs> one. Ladies and gentlemen, do you have any idea how hard you have to work to kill a fucking barn cat? <laughs> the most hardy, tenacious, feral some bitch that ever walked the planet? <laughs> Nothing kills them. You run over them with a pickup truck and they just meh. <laughs> to kill them all but one. You know why? I got too disconnected from nature. All that urban living, well, that's changed, you know? I've been out there a year and a half. I'm in the swing of things, buddy. I'm up every morning, 10.30, 11 o'clock, hell or high water. I mean, I've heard rumors of, rumors of farmers that are up at something like 4 a.m. But see, that's what that meth does to you. And I'm no different than any other Ohio farmer. We all do it the same. Get up every morning, we take off our sleep mask and <laughs> we pull our little silk kimonos tight against the cold and 
Make some strong coffee. Most farmers, we get ambient hallucinations. And, uh, <laughs> so for the first few months I was out there, I thought, well, I'm gonna treat these six barn cats like practice livestock. That's what I'll do. That'll be my chore. So I'd feed them out there in the barn. Well, after a few months, this got older. I thought, you know what, screw this. The cats can come halfway up the damn house. <laughs> so I'd toss the food in the yard and I'd go sit on the porch, you know, and have my coffee. And I'd watch this red-tailed hawk, beautiful red-tailed hawk lives out there. And I'd watch it, oh, he's pretty. I wonder what they eat. <laughs> Jesus, that cat can fly. <laughs> Told you, told you that science diet was worth the extra money. Uh -huh. <laughs> now I have one cat left. And he only made it because he's mean. Five pounds that cat weighs. I have to keep it on a logging chain. Kid you not. <laughs> Took down a draft horse last month. <laughs> Amish dude still pissed at me. <laughs> Screw thee! Although, you know, he may not even been Amish at all. I think he was a Mennonite. I think I heard car keys jingling in his pocket. <laughs> that cat's been with me. Man, that cat's been with me through some shit. That cat was with me. First day of hunting season last year, September, deer season. First day, I killed two deer on my farm. Never done that before. Dressed exactly like this, kid you not. I'm getting ready to go to the airport, go do a gig. And I look out in the pasture and I see something tan laying out there. And I'm, oh, oh, I've read about that. <laughs> That's a dead deer. I'm gonna go check that out. Come on, kitty. <laughs> so I go schlepping off across this pasture through all the corn stubble and the muck. I get all the way out there. What's well, not a dead deer? It's a piece of metal culvert pipe. And I kick this thing, I just bong. Soon as I do, these two huge deer leap up out of the brush, take off right in front of me. I'm, whoa! Wow, fucking A. Because I'm from Ohio, you know. Said, God, look at that. Kitty, look. Stay, stay. Well, unbeknownst to me, as soon as the deer take off running, kid you not, three hunters, I haven't even seen up to this point, pop up out of some weeds, just <laughs> blow the deer away right in front of me. Don't even say a word. Look over, just. <laughs> and I don't know what kind of queer bait they thought I was out there. Because <laughs> I sure as shit didn't look like a deer hunter. I looked a little more like some art gallery owner had gotten kidnapped, held for ransom in a nearby barn. <laughs> Happened to have gotten away. We got away, don't pay the ransom. Run, Snowball, run! <laughs> it's humiliating. I'm just trying to fit in. The only thing those hunters ever said to me was, is that your hunting cat? <laughs> Stay. Stay. It's not easy out there. You know what? It's the implements, the farming equipment you got to use. You don't, I'll tell you, you don't realize that the equipment you have to use. A lot of it is farming, is, I've learned, is about, you know, it's all managing, taming nature and working with na I had to buy a chainsaw. The most hor anybody here ever run a chainsaw? Ever run a chainsaw? I'll tell you, he'll tell you. He'll tell you. You ever read the instruction booklet to a chainsaw? You'd never start one. They're horrifying. There's something right called kickback. Can happen anytime, any place. You're just sawing away. Come back, cut your whole fucking head right in half. Happens so quick, so fast. You're alive and you know you're dead. Jesus, I'm dead! <laughs> Page one, just a picture of a stick figure with the legs flying off of it. <laughs> no, don't do this! Page two, a picture of a cooler with instructions how to pack severed limbs for later reattachment. 
first four days I had it, I wouldn't even start it. I just tried sawing with a bar. You know how fucking hard that is? <sighs> Finally, week goes by. Okay, I'm ready. I got the balls now. I'm gonna start this thing. I fill it full of gasoline, spend 20 minutes trying to start it. It won't start. You know why it wouldn't start? Two yeah, two cycle. <laughs> Something called two cycle. You have to, you have to measure out oil and pour it in the gasoline. Three dollars a gallon. I still have to complete the refining process? <laughs> Unbelievable, unbelievable. I've tried, I've tried doing hogs. I tried raising hogs. Anybody ever try to raise hogs? Oh my God, those things are brutal. They just soon kill you as look at you. Well, what happened was I thought, well, you know, I'll go into swine production. That's what we call it in the business. And I thought, well, I'll start with two. You want a small herd usually to start, so. <laughs> and I thought, well, you know, I'll, I'll, I'm gonna get two, I'm gonna get, I'm gonna get two, and then, you know, I'll get them in the fall, and then I'll fatten them up, and I'll slaughter them at the holidays, and then I'll have pork at like pennies a serving, and you know, you can give the meat out, you know, as treats, favors and stuff, right? <laughs> you know. So, I go out to this hog producer, and he's got like a thousand Pigs in a barn, I'm, whoa. And I, 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 he said, well, find a couple of the young ones you like, pick out a couple you like. So I look around, I say, all right, well, let me have the two calicos. <laughs> well, he looks at me like I'm some rest stop cocks. Well, it's not important. <laughs> so he shows me how to pick up the little pigs so they don't wriggle away and get away. Well, immediately when I pick up the pig, it defecates on me, immediately. <laughs> defecates down my leg, and I didn't know they'd do that, or I wouldn't have worn linen pants. I had a very nice pair of linen pants, very, kind of a salmon color. It's not important. So, he says, well, pull your livestock trailer around back, you fruit, and let, get the pigs. Well, I don't have a livestock trailer. It takes years to amass farm equipment. But I had a couple of dog carriers from when I'd lived in LA, right? You know. And again, he's looking at me like I'm some toe-tapping senator, right? <laughs> and I, I said, well, just put a bucket on its head and back it in, let's go. <laughs> so I get the pigs back to the farm. I, I put them in their stalls or whatever, and I put them in there, well, the next day, my well goes out. I had a well, and the well goes out. So now I have no way to give them water. So I have to run 300 feet of garden hose from my house through the Brita filter all the way out there to the thing, you know. And I screw a nipple feeder on the end of the garden hose, and I throw that in there and let them suck on that for a little bit. So I come back and check on about four or five days later. You want to check on hogs periodically. They ate the garden hose. I didn't know they would eat a garden hose. I didn't. They just kept pulling it in like it was intestines. It was just... So I had them slaughtered and, you know... I thought they, they kind of tasted like rubber in the meat. Not easy, my friend. Bale, baled hay out there. You know, and everybody where I'm from, when they bale hay, they do the big round bales, you see. And I thought, uh-uh, everybody does that. I'm going to do those little square bales, those little 50-pound bales. I'll corner the market. <laughs> you got miniature horses, you talk to me, motherfucker. <laughs> so I call this guy up that does the bailing, right? And I go leave town for a gig, right, like this. I come back on a Monday. Well, he's left the bales, hundreds of them all over the pasture. Yeah, and I call him up, what am I supposed to do about these? Well, you got, you got to hire some local farm kids and then put them on a wagon and then just put them up in the barn. Yeah, you try getting farm kids today, even off the, you know, out of the middle of the farming country off their PlayStation. I couldn't even get the Amish down there. Fuck thee. 
you know. Fine, I'll load the stuff myself. You try loading hay, 50 pounds of bale. Tell you what, you do 15, 20 of those a day, buddy, you know it. It's, it's a thousand pounds. Divided by 12 hours, I, well, I don't know, even I wanna know. I don't know. Boy, when you do hay and you get out there in the pasture and you start to realize how much marijuana is grown out there. A lot of marijuana. Man, they're good about it. They get it in fence rows and in between the rows of corn. And you can't round bale that pot. You can't. I think they do like a little shredded wheat bale for those. That probably use a Tonka tractor to pick that up. Hey, you've got to look at every angle to make money in farming. I get, right now, I get subsidies, thank God. Not from the government, farmers on either side of me, they pay me not to grow, but you know. <laughs> and they'll tell you this, I heard some guys back there farming, and they'll tell you it's not easy. You make, you, you make one, two mistakes and your whole year is shot. Knee high by the 4th of July, you know what that pertains to? Corn, that's right. You know where my corn was this 4th of July? Up to here, spent three weeks cutting that shit back. Yeah. Nature gets away from you. And they say my harvest will be down. Girlfriend, she hate, hated it out there, hates it. There's nothing to do out here, it's boring. There's plenty to do, it's not like I'm complete podunk, you know. I mean, I got the internet, but my internet service provider's so slow, you send an email, a guy runs out of my barn with a file folder under his arm. <laughs> There's a JPEG attached, he's humping a knapsack. <laughs> you know, we'd been fighting, of course, and I said, well, I'll try to do something romantic, you know, for, for a change. You know, I'll take her on a hayride, you know? You ever been on a hayride? I thought, that's romantic, you know? It's a hay wagon. With about 1,000 pounds of loose, fluffy hay. We're with about 15 other people. Everybody is smoking on top of this thing. <laughs> We're just human tinder on the hayride to Hades. Just romantic. I spent my entire ride looking for compatible skin graft donors. <laughs> I finally told the tractor driver, why don't you just drive us to the fucking Shriners burn unit? <laughs> It's not easy. And then I went into depression, clinical depression last year out there. A lot of farmers get depressed. I was out to some of my cattle, never came out of hibernation. My girlfriend, <laughs> you know, she's all upset about stuff. And all my buddies said, well, you got to take up a hobby. You need to take what you need to do. Take up a hobby. A lot of people out here in the farming community do take your mind off of stuff. I said, you're right. You know, well, what will I do? And, and longer burger baskets. I, <laughs> but I had all those, you know. And I think the precious moments thing is over with, if you ask me. So I thought, coyote hunting. I'm gonna take up coyote hunting. A lot of the guys out here do that. So that's what I did. I, I bought myself a nice 223 rifle, you know, right? With a bull barrel, big weaver scope. Stupid idea. Last thing you wanna do when you're clinically depressed, go sit by yourself in the woods all day with a fucking gun. And it's hard. People think it's easy to hunt coyotes. You just go out and oh, shoot. No, you got to call them in. So you're out there. Ah, 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 ah. That's a challenge command. Brings the males running in. Sometimes the females will respond to it too if you do it properly. Actually, I think it's too good. None of them ever want to challenge it. <laughs> Probably too alpha. <laughs> so anyway, I asked some of my buddies, I said, well, what am I doing wrong? I'm not getting any coyotes. And they say, well, for one thing, you gotta lose the suit. <laughs> Go out and get you some camouflage. You need to get some, get some mossy oak breakup. 
So I go out and I look at camouflage. Well, that crap is expensive. <laughs> Very expensive. I bought the wallet. I thought, okay, I'll buy the wallet. You know. <laughs> and then I lost it out there. I had 30 bucks in it and a picture of my cat. You know. It's not important. Anyway, I thought, well, I'm not going to spend all this money on this, on this camouflage. Not when I've got a nice comforter at home. I, a comforter on my bed. It's got a lot of earth tones and it splashes of green in it. And I thought, well, that'll, you know, that's perfect. I'll do like a camo cape and I'll go back out. <laughs> so I go out, back out. You know, rah, 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 rah. Nothing, not a fucking thick ticks. I got ticks all over the comforter. And that's what I got. <laughs> so I never did get to use this expensive coyote rifle, except once, once. I got to use it once. Last fall, I'm sitting in the office at home. I'm, I don't know, I'm trying to write or something. And I look out the window and my girlfriend, who likes to take hikes way out in there in the pasture and stuff, she's way the hell out there. And she's trying to get my attention for something. She's, hey, hey, look. And I, I don't know what the hell she's trying to show me. I can't, tell, I can't find the binoculars that are always laying there. So I opened the window and I said, you know what? I'm, I'm just gonna use that damn coyote rifle. <laughs> I'm just going to use the scope on it just to see what the hell she's trying to show me. <laughs> she can't possibly see me up here at the house. I can see the pores on her face in this thing. <laughs> anyway, I lose her in the scope. I take the rifle down. She's serpentining across the pasture. <laughs> up towards the woodlot, right? Doesn't talk to me for five days after that. You know. <laughs> Typical woman, overreact. <laughs> well, she did. There was a 30 mile per hour crosswind. Anybody knows you don't take that shot. Any questions about farming? Anybody need any? <laughs> My girlfriend insisted. You've got to get satellite television. There's nothing to do out here. Get satellite TV because I'm far enough out there. You don't get any television. So I get satellite TV, which I'm still pissed about because I pay $60, $80 a month. Yeah. Is that good? <laughs> Woo! Yeah, consume! Consume! But you know what? I, it's all crap. It's all drivel. I turn it on. It's nothing but ads. Everything is advertisements. Just all they want to do is. And you know what? I read somewhere recently they said, well, prescription drugs are now abused more than illegal drugs. And I thought, well, it's no wonder the way they're always prescribed. Every ad, you Paxil. What are probably the biggest selling antidepressant in the country? Women staring at me every day. Do you ever have days you wake up sad? Oh, sometimes feel overwhelmed. It's life, people. Jesus. <laughs> it's just going to be another year before they just have big salt blocks of this shit out on the street corners. <laughs> Everybody out there. Meh, meh, meh. Well, you know. Restless leg syndrome. I'd be happy to have one limb that was restless. <laughs> Eat a banana. <laughs> and I'm telling you, I, I, you know what? And you, you probably don't even think twice about, but uh, all these ads that we are barraged with for all this erectile, this Cialis, <laughs> Levitra, Viagra, there's going to be a big cost to pay. To, I, I'm telling you. You know, maybe there's a reason why your dick is supposed to stop working at some point down the line. Maybe that's why we have all these sex predators I read about now. We got 10 times as many hard dicks as we used to. All the young ones are coming up and the old ones don't die. It's like playing whack-a-mole, trying to keep the, you know? We need more flaccidity in this country. <laughs> Let's start with you, sir. <laughs> you ever done it? Viagra, Cialis, you ever done it? A buddy of mine gave me some. A buddy of mine gives me some. I said, well, thanks, but you know what? 
I'm 50 years old, my dick works perfectly fine like it always has. No, it doesn't. You think it does, but you don't realize that over the years, it's just slowly, imperceptibly starting to lose it. It's like, like driving a car with a slow leak in one tire. I mean, you get where you're going okay, but you're starting to swerve out of your lane towards the end. I did a half, a half of Viagra. And it was like, Jesus. Nobody deserves this. Precious master golem like depressed. Smeagle master Smeagle like. My dick was so hard that the head of my dick was so shiny I could do my hair in it. Unfortunately, what they fail to tell you in all these ads is though you may have the erection of a 19-year-old, you've still got the heart and lungs of a 50-year-old smoker. <laughs> I'm going to town on my girlfriend 15 minutes into it. <laughs> <laughs> you go on without me, Jesus. It's just everything. It's just pharmaceutical. You know, drugs. I and I did drugs. I did illegal drugs when I was young. I mean, I smoked pot for a long time. But you know, man, I tried smoking some again recently because I haven't smoked in a few years. Man, I I can't. You know what? With marijuana, the paranoia is always there for me. When I was 18, it was there. Shit! Is that the cops behind me? And at 50, it's no different. Shit, is that my life back there? <laughs> I don't encourage people to do drugs, discourage them, you do what you want, but you know, if I can be serious for 20 seconds, you know, I probably should never have gotten started. My first drug experience was horrible. I was 15 first time I got high. I got, my, I got my sister's purse, get a pack of matches or something, and I found dope in there. And my sister, ladies and gentlemen, was a big user. My sister was getting high every day, and I know she was. She had it all set up Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, so, you know. <laughs> I thought, well, I'll try a couple of these. I'll see what happens. I do a Tuesday, a Thursday, a couple of Sundays. I wake up next morning, my tits hurt like a son of a bitch. And I spotted my underwear, so. Let that be a lesson. I can't. Everything I turn on, everything I turn on television just, just gets to me. It's just nothing, you know. I saw, I saw news recently. A guy in Milwaukee, I think it was, gets busted, sentenced to prison for seven years because he had sex with a schizophrenic woman. And he got seven years because, and I didn't know this, it's against the law to have sex with somebody who's mentally ill, mentally unstable, which means apparently I've been a felon half my life. <laughs> I seem to draw nothing but the deranged. I, maybe it's the glasses. I look like some mental health professional, some beacon of lucidity. <laughs> he could fix me. <laughs> Have you ever kissed somebody who's nuts out of their mind? They taste different, like, they're, like their pH is out of whack, like, like their electrolytes are off. And they get that laugh, they get that laugh that crazy cackle. <laughs> and 
And I'll tell you, there are some, there are some crazies out there. And, I, and, and, I, and the bigger percentage of them, I know, has to be Los Angeles because that's where I was, you know. I'll, I'll tell you a quick story and the perfect example of one of the impetus why I left LA. And, and you talked to Range. This was a few years ago, Hollywood. I was in the second, maybe third day of a one night stand. <laughs> And it's going well. It's going well. We're laying in bed. It's a Sunday morning. I think we opted out of church that day. An Episcopalian. So we're laying in bed, and I kid you not, ladies and gentlemen, as we're laying there, this woman actually says to me, you know what I'm into, Drew? I'm into erotic asphyxiation. You know what that is, sir? She likes to be choked while she's having sex. Mm -hmm. I don't even know how somebody gets into a twisted fetish like that. I don't know if she's home one night, masturbating, gets her neck caught in a clock radio cord, <laughs> ties it together somehow, you know. <sighs> but I asked her, I said, all right, wh what is it precisely you want me to do? <laughs> well, take the belt out. Choke me while we're having sex. Mm. Well, I'm a pleaser. You know. I thought, okay, we'll do this. She'll get off. I'll get off. Everybody's happy. No. You have no idea how hard it is to try to fuck somebody and kill them at the same time. Very competing agendas. <laughs> and the neck is a really strong muscle. I had no idea. I'm giving this everything I've got. God, my arms are killing me. <laughs> oh, I was almost there. Oh, for crying out loud. <laughs> it's isometric or something. You know, works the triceps. I don't know. <laughs> anyway, anyway, I thought, you know what, Drew? Don't judge this. Keep an open mind, you know? Maybe, maybe you'll have fun. Maybe you'll get into it. No. You know what, I don't care how cute the girl, how good looking, you take any woman and just start throttling her half to death. Well, she's just gonna look like <laughs> It was all I could do to stay hard, to be honest with you. So anyway, we're just about to start the whole scenario. And she stops me. Well, there, Drew, there's something I've got to tell you. Us people who are into this, we have a safe word, code word. And if I say that word, then you stop, because that means it's getting out of hand, dangerous. Okay, good. Safety first. <laughs> so we're going at it. I mean, we're having sex and I'm choking her. Well, this probably goes on for 15 minutes. Yeah. When suddenly, out of the blue, she says to me, oh, oh, oh. I'm like, well, well that, that, that's not the word. That's... Well, about another 10 seconds goes by, and again, she reiterates, oh, oh, oh. You're getting warmer. <laughs> mm. Mm. So she blacks out. <laughs> now I've got a couple of minutes to myself. You know. <laughs> Having a cigarette, trying to untangle a very nice alligator belt. <laughs> when suddenly she comes to, happy as a clam. Just all lovey-dovey, snuggles right up next to me. Uh, Drew, do you love me? I tried to kill you, didn't I? Strange people out there. You know, I was talking about earlier the downside to getting older and 50 and stuff, but I will say, 
there is one upside. And I think, and I never thought I'd say that, but I think I like sex better now as an older guy than when I was a younger dude. And I didn't think I said, and I, you know why? Is because it's just, there's no pressure. It's just more, just no awkwardness when you get older about sex, just more relaxing. And I noticed, I thought about this, why that is. And I thought, you know, the biggest difference between sex when you're a young guy in your 20s and sex now, when you're a young guy and you're with your girl and you're just going at it, just going at it. <laughs> and in the middle of it all, ladies and gentlemen, in the heat of passion, your dick accidentally slips out. <laughs> well, when you're a young guy, all you can think is, oh man, I gotta get it back in right now. Right now, I gotta fuck. <laughs> That happens to you at my age. You say to yourself, well, while it's out, maybe I'll make a sandwich. <laughs> and you won! You've been great. I've been Drew Hastings.